Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Purple Noon, a podcast. I am Stephanie Conti, and I am here with the Paul or the Phil. Wait, was it Paul or Phil? It's Phil. That's enough, Paul. I thought he said Paul. Who's Paul? Maybe I'm making that up. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Who's Paul? Is his name Phil? That's enough, Phil. It his name is Phil. Phil. I messed up already. That's enough. I, you know, I was, I totally believed you. I was like, yeah, that that does sound like Doesn't the main character's sound name. Right? I thought it, it does sound right. right. All right, whatever. It's been like a, two weeks. Sorry, Phil. It is. It's okay. But anyways, um, so yes. I, you probably won't be able to tell what we're going to be talking about based on that, but I am here with my co-host and my bestie and uh, the second love of my life. I legally have to say that because if I didn't, I can't, I, I should not host a podcast when I don't know how to turn off my alarms. My Lord. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I like where it's that always, was going, this is the second time it's happened. This is the second time in a row for the podcast. But anyways, may I introduce Savannah Lanelse? Hi, everybody. So it's sorry about Valentine's that brief interruption. Day, this Monday. And I got yes. you a present. You know, nothing says love in the air like this movie. Oh, you God. Know? <laughs> nothing says love in the air like a little bit of anthrax on the rope. You know? You know? Spoiler. Spoiler. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we are going to be talking about the power of the dog today. You know. Very romantic film. A film known <laughs> for nothing but its romance, you know? Um, so let's get straight into it. Unless, Savannah, do you have any announcements? Do you have anything you want to say before we get into it? Or are we going to just jump right no, in? we got to jump. There's, we have to jump into this one. We got to jump. There's no other option. So today we are going to be talking about The Power of the Dog. Um, it is about a charismatic rancher named Phil Burbank um, who inspires fear and awe in those around him. While his brother brings home a new wife and her son, Phil torments them until he finds himself exposed to the possibility of love. So I feel like that is a very, very weird way to describe the film. It does not evoke the emotions of the film that I personally felt. But I digress, and we'll talk about it in a minute. It is written and directed by James Champion, and it stars Benedict Cumberbatch as Phil, Kirsten Dunst as Rose Gordon, Jesse Plemons as George Burbank, husband and wife duo. We have Cody Smith-McPhee as Peter Gordon. Um so Savannah, we ended up uh, going to see this movie in theaters. Haha, <laughs> five dollar movie one. ticket. <laughs> what is this? The Prohibition era. <laughs> um, so we saw this. Oh yeah, we saw it in the theaters. Meanwhile, we could have. Uh, I mean, even though it was only five dollars, we're kind of still suckers for paying five dollars to see a movie that when we already pay for Netflix and stuff. But who cares? We saw we're it on the big people. screen, and we're it was fun. People. Yeah. So and we had the theater to ourselves. It was a great experience. And I got some lobster grilled cheese, and we shared popcorn. So it was good. It was very romantic. It was delectable, <laughs> delectable. So Savannah, what are your non-spoiler thoughts about the power of the dog? I will. I always like to start with positives. Um, definitely one of the more original movies we've seen, and I mm -hmm. like, you know, stories with new storylines originality I, I think we see a lot of the same things every year so kudos to them um if you were gonna watch a movie and you needed to study the art of subtlety this is your movie because i haven't seen a film that has done it so well between the acting the plot it, and you know everything it, it's just very subtle but they mm -hmm. do it almost perfectly so that was very impressive to see. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch did very, very well. He obviously stands out in the movie. I think he should get some recognition for this. As for the boy that plays Peter, Kirsten Dunst also did a beautiful job. Jesse Plemons did well. There just wasn't much for his character to do. But um, all in all, I, I enjoyed seeing the performances um, and the story definitely turned me on its head. Like I was not expecting it to go that way at all, which was a surprise. I don't know if it was like, I would say a good surprise, but it was a surprise. Um, so I appreciated that. I think it is definitely worth to see this movie. Um, 
And I think that's, that's the positives for me. What about you? I honestly was not expecting the movie to wait just from what I read this stuff, what I was expecting from the, the whole plot line that I read about it. I was like, Oh, I think, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch's character is going to get jealous of his brother and Rose, and he's going to do what he can to get the girl and things like that. <laughs> silly me, silly me, silly me thinking that this was a story about straight people. Um, so, yeah, that really took me by surprise. I even messaged my dad. I was like, <laughs> I messaged my dad while watching the movie because he was like, that movie was good, you know, but he didn't, he, you know, it's just I wasn't told. So I guess he just he didn't want to tell me because he wanted it to be a surprise and stuff because I you know I just I wasn't expecting it I just texted him what in the LGBT is this <laughs> and he was like it's good right it's so also because the way we find out about the character is very strange I will say there was several minutes where I thought he's in love with the horse <laughs> There were several minutes where I looked at you, I looked at my boyfriend, Zach, and I said, this man is about to commit bestiality somewhere. Because there was, we were talking about, like, you know, we saw a saddle. We saw a little a little plaque with the saddle. And I'm like, and he's massaging the saddle aggressively, erotically. And I'm like, this dude wants to get with the horse. I was so wrong it um so I, that, that the name was bronco henry it did not help. Oh, come on come on <laughs> really that that's a horse's name you know <laughs> you know like even for that time you know everyone's name is phil burbank rose gordon george burbank and then you have bronco henry that's a horse that did that does not help Maybe even in this movie, it could have been the name of a car, like an old, <laughs> like, you know, T, Model T, I you agree. know, but no, Bronco Henry. I just also wasn't expecting the sensuality of this film. What do I mean by that? I mean, the creepy eroticism that we saw with the character Phil Burbank out naked in the fields, really <laughs> running that towel along his face and everything was not expecting that i liked it it still creeped me out a little bit because he's just it's just a little towel you know you know it was just a little weird it was just a little jarring because again like we went from this guy taking some revenge against his family to this new plot line that kind of smacked us in the face and again he like you said he was rubbing himself he's in like a river and it's just this little. He dirty has little like a little, like a little hobbit hole where he keeps like his mementos of gay paraphernalia memory. under. You know, like it was just it. It took me aback because also keep in mind, I w- I will say I think one of the it, it works as a double edged sword because the movie is very slow and you know in the beginning and things like that. So you're not expecting this stuff midway. You know, we get like the chapter one and the chapter two that, and stuff like that that comes up and stuff. And by chapter two, I'm like, oh, he's in love with the horse. Now, it then, you know, I saw the saddle, the saddle rubbing. I saw, you know, some – I even saw the paraphernalia in the tree. And I'm still thinking – Maybe still horse, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe horse adjacent, you know, and then finally we get to um, man. <laughs> and that's not me just, that's not me being homophobic. That's not me being like, I don't want it to be a man. That's no, just me just, genuinely thinking that this movie was about a horse lover, you know? It was just not, I mean, I, like I said, I really like that the movie is subtle and it doesn't treat its audience stupid. Like they, the movie is filmed in a way where like they're assuming the people that are watching it are intelligent, which I always appreciate, but it was very misleading. It was not only like, like but I think saying, it was like, for a like good thing. Horse? I think it was for, well, cause at the end of the day, I would prefer him lusting over former gay lover as opposed to horse. Well, no, that would have been, <laughs> you know, so I will movie. take that. Um, but it was, it, you know, it's just, I, 
I do have to agree with you because describing this movie and as I'm thinking about it and going back to scenes and stuff, it is such a unique film. And I'm saying unique and I'm not saying I'm, I'm not saying it's new. I'm not saying it's fresh. I'm not saying all those. I'm saying unique because it has weird undertones to it um, from the character Phil. And then, because if that wasn't a surprise enough, like, you know, that was a surprise in it of its own. Then all of a sudden we get introduced to this little skinny string bean guy <laughs> named Peter. I, I even think they call him string bean at some point. And we landed on Dexter. You know, we went from, we literally went from um, Brokeback Mountain to the TV show Dexter. Like, you know, like it, it took me aback. We went on a journey with this movie without moving from this little town, you know? Every character, I want to say, except what was his brother's name? George? George. I mean, George had an issue. George seemed very oblivious to everything, in my opinion. I mean, Phil was tormenting his new wife and um, Peter... And all he would say is, like, that's enough, or, like, you know how Phil is. Well, I will say, George's mental illness is that he's the most oblivious man to ever exist. <laughs> like, your <laughs> wife is sneaking drinking. hooch, bottles of hooch in your bedroom, and you're not noticing that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the woman who didn't like drinking is now drinking more liquor than any other character in the movie. Dude, that poor woman. Like, she was getting tormented. Oh, my God. I think... What were we laughing? She was trying to practice the piano for her guests. Yeah. And then Phil starts like aggressively playing his banjo to like and trying to like outperform her. her. <laughs> it was a lot. And on top of that, like what started was I think he was talking about like he he they were introduced because they were running a restaurant. And then Phil commented to Peter because Peter like you know he was really into art and he was making like these paper flowers and he was like making fun of him calling him a girl you know insinuating that he was you know gay and stuff and just like from the beginning of this movie this man is relentless for what it seems to be no reason and then yeah. he seems jealous that his brother gets a wife and then he seems upset I don't know then he tries to take peter under his room it, it was just the movie was going through a lot of phases it, in a lot of different a character lot of phases yeah like it, it, like a lot of different phases and then it went from not only just oh i'm gonna mess with rose by taunting her with the piano then there was a point where i looked at you and i'm like <laughs> i kind of looked at you and i'm like he's messing with rose because he's threatening to sodomize her son you know because then all of a sudden he's being real friendly with um peter He's being real friendly with Peter. He's like, I'm going to put Peter on the horse. I'm going to take him in the mountains <laughs> alone. I may or may not bring a condom. He doesn't say that, but that's kind of like the feel of what you get in the, in the scene and stuff. Because Rose is just in shambles at that point. You know, Rose is, is like full breakdown stage because – she notices something's up. She doesn't want to say anything. You know, all of a sudden, like, the kid who was made fun for being gay is now kind of doing little gay things with, you know, with Phil and stuff like that. It was a whole thing. It was a whole, like, psychological deboggle. That's what it was. I mean, I'm sure, like, it was interesting because I think later on I thought about it and they were there were parallels between Phil and Peter. They were yes. both, I mean... We later learned that Phil was, like, groomed by Bronco Henry. And that's not funny. It's just the way it was also, again, like, the way things happen in this movie catch me by surprise and, like, made me laugh a little bit. They're Are we going to talk about the aggressive hula hooping? Yes, yeah, very serious things in this movie. Oh, my God. That's right. How the most psychotic person in this movie ends up aggressing, hula, aggressively hula hooping when they get angry. That's I mean, what this movie brought to us. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, there were that was really funny. And it wasn't- It was a hard it, cut to the hula hoop too. It was like, oh yeah, you're such a sissy boy. And I then mean, it just <laughs> went to the hard cut of the hula hoop. <laughs> 
<laughs> but as I'm talking about, like, there were very serious moments where we're talking about very serious topics, and then something will catch me off guard, like that. Um, yeah. There were the, the scene, even where Peter, like, finds out uh, Phil's secret, I think, like, he gets caught, and then Phil starts running after him naked. Caught me by surprise. That wasn't supposed to be funny, but it was. A Another surprise, too, movie. is genuinely so i was reading that apparently because i'm looking at benedict cumberbatch and i'm like this man is covered in a layer of grease and dirt and it was because he didn't shower <laughs> during the production disgusting. of filming disgusting um no but i was i was saying that there are a lot of it was interesting to see the parallels between phil and peter because yeah. they are supposed to be super smart we learned that phil like went to college and peter's studying to be a doctor and they're, you know, I, I'm sure when Phil was younger, he was in that situation. And and they turn out to be both bad people. So it was really cool to see that. Um, Kirsten Dunst was very good in this movie, too. But other than, like, she, her job in this movie was to be just hysterical the entire time. Mm-hmm. And... I think she did fantastic at it, but I would have liked to see something else too. Maybe a little bit more of a vindictive side to her because thinking about it now, like the way she dealt with Phil was whenever he would like metaphorically hit her, like the banjo aggressiveness and whatever he would do, she would yeah. kind of like cave into herself, which I think is a good direction for the character. But considering her son was who he was, I thought maybe it would have been cool to see like a little vindictive streak. And we did see it a little bit, but like something else. I think also there could have been because honestly, like Jesse Plemons character was used a lot in the movie. And then the middle, he just kind of disappears. I wish at some point they did bring him back and stuff. And I would have loved for Chris Dunst's character to have like a full blown like breakdown in front of her husband and about it and stuff like that. Like, I think that would have been something because i i feel like and i hate saying it like this Kristen dunce was almost a little bit wasted potential in this movie yeah i i think it it just it got not her performance but this her storyline got repetitive for sure like obviously like she's in this endless cycle right and everything obviously she starts drinking and stuff but it's the fact that you know Jesse Plemons' character, George Burbank, just disappears middle of the movie, you know? And I wish that they would have brought him back. I wish that they, you know, she would have been like, I can't with your brother. He's making me insane. He's doing this. And like, you know, show like a full like type of psychotic breakdown with her and things like that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know what else is weird? What? Do you remember that they slept in the same bed? And it was weird because they lived in a mansion. And Phil and George were sleeping in the same bed. Yeah. I didn't understand why. What was that? They didn't explain that. Well, I think that. that's also why, like, and I, I remember joking about it. Like, in the beginning, I was, because uh, they wake up in the same bed together in the beginning, the brothers. And when, uh, like, you know, he marries Kristen and stuff, I was like, you know, oh, I was saying to myself, like, Benedict Cumberbatch is just pissed off that he has to sleep alone now. He can't sleep with his brother in the bed anymore, you know? So I wonder if maybe that was, and I think that could be a reason why maybe the brother George saw his brother as more like saw Phil as more of a softer person than what he actually was. And I don't know, like, it's also just weird that it's like you have Phil here who's like, you know, looking at anyone who looks at him weird and going, you're a sissy boy. And then all of a sudden, you know, he's sleeping in the bed with his brother. Yeah, I don't I don't understand. The only thing I can think of was. So do you think he knew about Bronco Henry and. He was he just felt bad for Phil. And that's why he never said anything when he was acting like a fool. I don't think so. Only because I feel like it would have been brought up at some point. Like if I'm imagining this is like a real life scenario, right? I feel like Jesse Plemons' character would have mentioned it at some point when he started seeing that jealousy with Kirsten. Like at some point, Jesse should have been like, bro, you don't even like girls. <laughs> You don't even like girls. Why are you playing games? That literally would have yeah. stopped midway. The movie would have had to end if that happened. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Because otherwise, I I didn't understand why 
he was letting this I mean it, it also could have been the fact that like they didn't mention that Phil did go to college but he ended up doing the hard labor while George like handled I guess the business side of things so mm-hmm. maybe he felt guilty about that but in my head it still didn't make up for the fact that like Phil was acting crazy I don't know there was nothing that could make it up in my head so why he was so passive it still doesn't make a hundred percent sense to me right now I don't know yeah it, it, it you know I think and I do want so apparently this was all based off a book I would love to read the book to see if it did kind of explore these gay undertones or if it did not for the times because apparently the original book came out in like I think I know before like the 90s I don't know if it's 1950s or 1980s I'll have to look it up but I would love to see if the book kind of took on the same approach and maybe that's why there were some kind of gaps in it because we just couldn't fit everything in the movie um but yeah like it the whole Phil being gay thing was a pleasant surprise. I thought it added, it, it, you know, and there are some times where I do feel like um, adding gay characters for the story, it, it can be a little bit gay baity, you know, which just for the, oh my God, like we're just going to add some type of representation in here, but not because we actually care about representation. Does that make sense? Yeah, we've had this conversation before. I think it's definitely progress that, the movie didn't harp on him being a gay character. You know, it was interesting to finally like walk into a movie and not know that beforehand because I've also never experienced that. Yeah. And and I think that's also why I added this great element of surprise, right? Because I also like the fact that him being gay wasn't like the selling point of the movie, if that makes sense. Um, because I felt like it was a great surprise. It was a great surprise, not just simply where it's like, yay, queer, you know, it's not like anything like that or anything. It's because it's like, oh, we're seeing a side to this character now and it feels like we're not supposed to see it. And it adds like this whole deeper element to the story and it's used really well for the story's sake. And it, it's used really well in terms of from the middle of the film to the end of the film is what I think is the best portion of the movie. That first beginning and stuff like that, the whole, you know, getting to know Phil, getting to know all of that stuff. I feel like honestly could have been cut down to 30 minutes. Maybe it was, it just felt like a while, but I felt like it could have been cut down to 30 minutes and we really could have focused more in on the relationship that Phil starts with um, Peter. Yeah, no, I think that should have started sooner. So we, we kind of see, you know, Peter take this turn, right? Because we see him as a sweet boy. We just think, oh, he's sweet little innocent boy who angrily hula hoops. What what harm could he do? All of a sudden, he gets gifted or he finds like a pet rabbit and stuff like that. And next thing you know, this bunny rabbit is splayed out, killed, gutted, everything like that. Really disturbing stuff. And we see him do this with a few, you know, more things. And of course, if you know anything about any type of like serial killers and stuff like that, even if the person's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to med school. That is textbook stuff right there for serial killer alert or serial killer vibes, at least. So but even when he was doing that, the mm -hmm. movie, I will say the movie was fantastic with how they kind of portrayed it, because I was like, oh, yeah, medical school. That wasn't a red flag for me. Believe it or yeah. not. I think it wasn't only until the third time where I was like, hmm, like, uh, three rabbits. I don't know about you, but I didn't suspect anything in the beginning. I only suspected it because it was something that him and his mom found and they were like, can we keep it? Can we keep it? And stuff like that. So it was the fact that like his mom had known about it. That's what made me like, oh, like if he had hit it and then did it, that would have made more sense. But the fact that his mom was like, oh, cute little rabbit. And the next thing you know, it's it's dead on the page. You know, because he had like taped it and like used pins and stuff like that. Very gross stuff. Um, so that was a little bit of a red flag to me. And then obviously it kept happening again. And then I think we finally get that full feature of, oh, this is the big red flag is when he stumbles across a, I believe it was a dead cow. And then, then we discover the science behind anthrax. So for those of you who may not know, anthrax is a very deadly endospore bacteria where you can get it underneath your skin. It can kill you. It was also utilized as a biomedical warfare a few years ago in the early 2000s. So there's your little anthrax synopsis. But he notices the anthrax. 
And, you know, to, I I think also what, when you were bringing up the point that it's like, this director doesn't treat us like we're stupid. They don't go into anthrax. They don't do what I did. And they go, here's what anthrax is. They just look at it and they're like, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's gross stuff. Right. And we really don't fully comprehend, especially if you don't know what anthrax is, what happens until we just get these glimpses of um phil interlocking the 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 rope and stuff like that with the the blood on his hand you know with that giant gash on and then we see it's just kind of emphasized and emphasized and we're thinking like is there something wrong with this rope so i really liked that whole setup too i really think it was interesting maybe a little bit more context of anthrax would have helped people but i don't know what did did you understand the whole anthrax thing like from the get-go like how did you feel about it they mentioned at one point very, very quickly that it was dangerous. Um, and it wasn't until I saw the little cow thing. And then at one point he offers um, Phil his, his whatever it was, rope to mm-hmm. use. And then I realized I'm like, oh, this, this guy's going to get really sick. Yeah. But no, I didn't understand like, oh, it gets under the skin. And no, no, no. I, I just knew that like it was probably going to poison him in some capacity. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, there was also, um, there's this moment and I, I wanted to know what your thoughts are in regards to, um, Peter's past, because we're, we're told that his parents have passed, that that's not his actual mother, right? Yes, it's not. I think that's his aunt, if I'm correct. so do we think that maybe he, with his little serial killer ways and things like that, do we think that he may have been involved with his family injuries? It's possible. I, I think, I mean, definitely. But I also think this kid is clearly bullied a lot. Like we see in the restaurant scene, I think that's a huge hint that like when uh, Phil is bullying him, everybody laughs everybody thinks it's hysterical and I think it could be an easy situation where like okay like this kid has been tormented his entire life and on top of that Phil was also tormenting his mother so I don't know if it was a situation where like he killed his parents for the sake of killing his parents or like this is someone who's been genuinely tormented their entire life And now this person is tormenting his now, his now mother. Mm -hmm. So I I could see it maybe if his parents were like crazy abusive. Yes. But I I didn't get the sense from the character that he was just killing to kill also. Yeah. It it seemed like, even though I say serial killer, I think it's more like obviously the trade, you know, like kind of like the, the traits and stuff like that. I don't think he was, it is possible though. Because no, I'm not ruling it out because the whole medical school demise and stuff like that, that's a really smart cover. You yeah, know, you know oh, I'm learning did. about bones. I'm learning about all this stuff because I want to be a doctor. Um, so that's a really good hidden. But I, I do think um, I, I do think that, you know, he knew that he like not only did he was curious as to see like what would happen if phil used the rope and stuff and he knew that obviously phil had the cut on his hand and everything like that but i think he also because phil kept undermining him a lot and there was even a point where they're talking in the fields and stuff like that where um i think like peter says like no i'm a strong person i'm much stronger than you think or something in the lines of that and then, you know, Phil's like, yeah, whatever. Okay, dude. Yeah. And then next thing you know, I think it was also not just for, like, I want to do this medically. I think it was for his own personal enjoyment as well. Yeah, that that could definitely be. I could see that for sure. Do we – but do you also think that he did it for his mom? Yeah, because I, I think there was a genuine, like, care there. Like, he would always try to, like, when, when Kirsten Dunst was, like, drinking her life away he would always try to take the alcohol away like it seemed like he would try to take care of her Mm -hmm. um and also this takes this wasn't just a quick thing he phil was doing this for what it seemed to be like months to a year yeah and so i do think i'll maybe theoretically if phil had just stuck to him maybe he would have like let it slide he would have just hula hooped or something 
but because I think his now mom was involved, I do think like it kind of just pushed him Mm -hmm. to being like, okay, this guy has to go because they're never going to be happy. If you had to say like, who do you think uh, did the best acting overall in this movie? I I do think it's Benedict Cumberbatch because he had the most complex Range. character. Yeah, because Phil was going through a lot emotionally. Mm-hmm. Even when he was crazy, like there was such an influx of emotions all the time where he was getting frustrated. He was mourning a lot of the times. He was taking his rage out on people. I think there was just a lot of emotions that Benedict Cumberbatch had to kind of balance out. I think Kirsten Dunst did a a fantastic job with how she uh, portrayed Rose, because I I do think there was also a level of skill there Mm -hmm. that was very impressive. Um, But I I think Benedict Cumberbatch that for for yeah because i mean i was i and i think cody smith mcphee did a great job but i think a lot of like his performance is done in well-written writing for his character arc whereas i think you know with benedict cumberbatch and his character i think a lot of those emotions and stuff you can put them on the paper but they have to translate somehow into the screen and he does a beautiful job translating all those complex emotions as you were saying and everything um i really and i'm sure that this is one thing that was probably one of the bigger standouts of the film besides the acting and the psychodrama elements of it um where they filmed this movie was beautiful yes it was by far one of the prettiest movies i had seen in a while probably within last year or so um in terms of like just scenery and everything like that um i really love the the use of like these really like sharp mountainsides in the background and stuff very rigid like I felt like it was like a really great um and even if itself I do feel like that the mountains in some way do represent Phil because they're very jagged they're very you know sharp they're very like the scenes that they had them in they were very like wow like you could not like they were you know showstoppers Um, and then you had like this little hidden dog figure in there when you were watching it and then, you know, and stuff like that. And I think that that represents him. Like that little dog is kind of like his secret that like he wants to wear on his sleeve, but he knows Mm -hmm. he can't. So he puts it in like another form. That's good. So I had never seen a, have you seen anything from Jane Campion before? This is my first time seeing something from her. Mm, I don't think so. So Maybe. she's I, I I know she she's made the movie The Piano um, and Bright Star. But the one thing I would love to see from her in terms of like her past filmography that I would love to watch would be um, Top of the Lake. OK, I, it, I remember it being like a, a limited series and stuff that was done really well. So I do want to see that. Um, and I'm trying to think like she's done some other things, too. But in regards for her from her beginning of the career to now she's probably done only about 15 yeah 15 movies wow no i haven't seen anything i I did want to see the piano a lot of people talk about it um but no i haven't seen anything really Mm -hmm. um do you think that power of the dog because um when we're recording this tomorrow um oscar nominations are going to be out do you think that this movie is going to get nominations as well as do you think that there's any potential for any winners in here i think um possibly for adapted screenplay i could see and i can see okay. that at the cumberbatch and maybe kirsten dunce maybe Depending on who else is in the lineup. I definitely think it's going to be Benedict Cumberbatch, cinematography. Okay. And I do, I don't think, uh, it might be a Best Picture nomination, but I don't think it's actually going to win it. Because I usually do like 10 movies for Best Picture. Um, I don't think it's going to be the Best Picture winner. Um, and I think possibly Cody Smith McPhee might get a nomination as well. I could also see maybe directing as well, but... I do think that there were some other stronger contenders, like with Macbeth coming in and stuff like that a little bit later. I think that one is going to take her spot. Okay. We need to talk about the nominations at some point. Yes. Oh, my God. I can't wait. It's tomorrow morning. I'm so excited. Like, And I know, like, 
you know, people are like, the Oscars are rigged, blah, blah, blah. I like the Oscars. I like watching them and stuff. I like, yeah, me too. Me I too. like the whole glitz and glamour of it, you know, and as someone who's always watched those and stuff like that and, like, always looked at them very magically and stuff, I'm going to keep that magic alive, you know? This, I only watch the I, – I'm not a big Golden Globes person either. I'm not, like, a big um, Emmys person. I love the Oscars. Oscars. Always the Oscars, you know? That's the one. Golden Globes were good, but they kind of fumbled. They kind of fumbled recently, you know, with their – their um, they just – being dumb, you know, like they're just being dumb. You know, how are you going to be the Hollywood Foreign Press Association and every single person on that thing is white? You know, just dumb things, yeah, you know, you update. You gotta people update. not not thinking and stuff like that. But I'm excited to see the Oscars. I'm excited to see what's to come. I know that um, I even think um, I think it actually won maybe a Golden Globe for something. Okay. I know it was definitely nominated. I'm checking right now. Uh, maybe not. Maybe I am wrong. I totally thought it had like – because the Golden Globes happened, and they weren't televised or anything like that, right? It did happen. I don't remember. I didn't read too much on it, though. Let me see, because I could have sworn. Yeah, Power of the Dog won for Best Motion Picture Drama. Very cool. Power of the Dog won, as well as Cody Smith McPhee won for Best Supporting Actor. Awesome. Dude, oh my god, you know see. this was filmed in New Zealand? Yeah. Oh, and Jane Campion won for Best Director. Good for her. We love to see women win. Good for her. Um, yeah, it was shot all in New Zealand and stuff, which I think was like an excellent location for it. Because it's supposed to be like 1920s. Um, I think it was such a unique background to use than like, you know, the standard type of saloon sets that they have here in the U.S. and stuff, yeah. you know? Yeah. So overall, what would you rate this film and would you own it on DVD? Um, I would give it a 8 out of 10 because okay. I was invested in the story. I was hooked. Uh, acting was fantastic. I enjoyed the plot in general. However, it is a very slow burn. And there were just some points where like, I should have taken it seriously. And I didn't. Um, if they came out with some like if, if Criterion released this, I think I would buy it. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, I would like to see it at least one or two more times. Yeah. Um, but I think I wouldn't buy it unless there was like a special disc because it is gotcha. on Netflix. So that is I don't true. Know, I don't know if I would like keep it unless Criterion or it, it was a special disc, uh, like edition collector's disc. But eight out of ten, I was I was very invested in the story, and I can see myself coming back to this movie at some point. Gotcha. Okay. I think for me, I'd probably go a little bit lower. I'd give it a seven point five because. I really think the beginning and the slowness of the film hinders the film. Sure. By a lot. By more than I'd like to admit. Um, do I still recommend the film? Absolutely. The whole ending from middle to end and stuff like that is totally worth, you know, kind of biting your lip through the beginning. But I also am not a fan of how these phenomenal actors were used in the film. I felt like... Chris, uh, Kirsten Dunst was a little bit of wasted potential. Yeah, I even change. feel like Jesse Plemons. Yeah, justice for Jesse, because I think they could have used him more. He was very quiet. He was very quiet. It was just, and you know, it, it's just, I was expecting a lot more from both yeah. of them, especially when you consider the, the psychodrama elements. They definitely could have turned the dial up between some drama between them, and it still would have been a great film. It still would have been it still would have had like a good amount of drama in it without being too overboard. So I just feel like it was a little bit of wasted potential to use the, such two good actors. Um, and, you know, that does kind of, I'm like, come on, why? You know, Jesse Plemons is a fantastic actor. Kirsten Dunst, fantastic actor. And they were very limited. Um, you know, overall, even if, you know, because we had the Benedict Cumberbatch as Phil and we had Cody Smith McPhee as Peter and they give like the two most complex performances in the movie. Yet we don't even see Peter for more than half of the film. 
you know, in yeah, terms of he kind of just bounced. He kind of just is in the little like uh, uh, the Peter. He's in a little bit in the beginning. We see flashes of him here and there. Then he's the prime focus at the end. Jesse Plemons comes in. He's the full main like hour of the movie, pretty much the full main hour of the movie. And then he leaves, and we don't know why. It, business he's conducting business so it's just it kind of bothers me how those characters were used i felt like they could have been utilized a little bit more but once again i don't know if it's trying to be so true to the actual like story the book that it was based off of so we'll see about that i do want to read the book it does look really really interesting um the directing i thought was good however i do feel like especially with the backgrounds and stuff directing could have been played with a little bit more I would have okay. loved to seen some more dramatic shots. You know, I would have loved to seen, you know, when he's, and there were some beautiful like alignments and stuff like that, right? Like when he's in the field and he's taking the little towel and brushing it, the handkerchief and brushing it all across his body and face and stuff like that. I feel like we could have really utilized moments like that when we're seeing Phil and we could have amped up the directing a little bit, like maybe just adding a little bit more movement because the film is relatively still. It's a lot of still shots. I feel like during moments like this, we could have we could have used a little bit of pizzazz, even if it's just like on a tripod, just doing a little track from side to side, whatever it may be. I feel like that could have added like a ooh, you know, like the minute, like if you're think of this, bestie. If you're watching a film, right, and all you're seeing is like still shots, then all of a sudden, middle of the film, you see Benedict Cumberbatch naked in a field, running a <laughs> handkerchief across them. Now the camera gets a little movement. Now we're doing a zoom in on them. Now you're thinking, ooh, ooh, yes, that's true. you know, you get that, you get that. I, I'm also someone who's super dramatic, so I like that dramaticism. You know, I, I really like that. Um, so that's why I would give it a 7.5. I still recommend it. I still think it's a great film, but those are things that personally that I'm like, mm, you know, miss too many missed opportunities for my comfort. Um, but the whole plot is stellar. The whole plot is incredible, stellar, really original, really unique. But I'm sorry, Jane Campion, you did great. But I, I still, there was still a little bit more room for pizzazz. I just needed a little bit more pizzazz from you. I could see that. I can mm -hmm. definitely see that. That's kind of how I felt about House of Gucci. I'm like, oh, you we gotta talk about House of Gucci next. There wasn't enough pizzazz. And it was divine. <laughs> <laughs> All I can think about is um, Jared Leto's performance, which I have to talk about. Because look, and I'm gonna say it right now as a little teaser. I'm gonna defend Jared Leto, and I'm gonna crap on Ridley Scott. You know we're getting a Razzie, right? He's getting a Razzie, and uh, you know what? I bet you a quarter, a whole quarter, that he is also going to get a Oscar nom, dude. A I, whole quarter. The internet's gonna flip. No, I think you know. I'll, I'll just say this as my teaser. It was such a weird thing to go see The Last Duel and be impressed and then go see House of Gucci and be confused. <laughs> That's how I felt. I mean, I enjoyed it, but it was confusing. But we'll have to talk about You have to tune in next time to hear us talk about yes, it. Yes, next time we'll be talking about House of Gucci because there's, there's a lot to be said about the movie, good and a little bit bad. So... Um, with that being said, um, those are our final scores. And would I own this on DVD? It's a hard one. I know I had to think about it. Only if there was like, mm, I don't know. I, I feel like it had to be a criterion. It'd have to be a criterion. You know? Yeah. If it was either a criterion or not to sound like an a-hole, if it was discounted. Because I'm thinking like $20, $20, $40 for the Criterion, and I'm adding to my collection, right? That's fine. And I'm also getting all the bonus features that I would want from this film. If it's just standard Blu-ray, $20, I probably couldn't. No, I can't justify $20. 20 I probably couldn't. $40 for the bonus features and a little cool little booklet and a sick cover. It better be a sick cover. Yeah. And then I'll pay the $40 happily. But for, you know, it's on Netflix for free. So that's, that's what I'm why. saying. Like, that's hard to justify. Yeah. Unless there's special features. But, but thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for listening. As always, shout out to Homeboy, 
Oh my god, I'm flipping the names in my head. Help me <laughs> out, Savannah. James. Help me. Oh boy, James, Sensei David, and Danny Boy. Danny Boy, thank you, thank you. Thank yeah, you also guys. I was like, homeboy. Oh uh, I was just flipping all the names and just trying to figure out which one matched. Um, <laughs> thank you for helping me with that. Um, as always, please check out if you're listening to on YouTube. Please check out all the links below. Um, we have our TikTok. We have our which I haven't been posting a lot lately because I've been busy in school. Don't judge me. Um, but. Uh, TikToks, we have TikToks accounts, Instagrams. Um, we also have a Patreon, and that's how you get a cute little cheeky little shout out every episode. A if you shout out. The, the dollar um, Patreon there, so be sure to check that out. Um, also, if you're not subscribed to on YouTube, Spotify, all these places, please make sure to subscribe there. Make sure you know you're getting alerts for this type of stuff for this premium free content. Um, <laughs> And yeah, just thank you all so much for listening. So next time we'll be talking about House of Gucci. We also have The Godfather coming up because we're going to be seeing that in three hours. Would you believe like a little kid, like a little kid Savannah, when I went to go see House of Gucci in theaters because it was playing again recently, um, which by the way, if you haven't seen it, you should go see it in theaters. <laughs> Why not? Um, support your local theaters. Um, I'm, I'm walking up the, the aisle to get to our seats, right? And all of a sudden I hear... <laughs> I run. I abandon Zach. I just start running so I can get to the screen and so I can see it. Zach is like, wait, and I just run because I just had to see it and just see what it looked like for the advertisements for it. So I am so excited to be seeing that on the big screen and stuff. It's gonna be Dolby too. It's gonna be the I real deal. Me. I'm gonna sneak in sushi. That's gonna be so good. <laughs> I oh my god, I'm so excited. Maybe chicken guy. I'm thinking. Oh, you get they got long lines though. Oh, you're right. They got Another really long line. lines. Do you remember we got chicken guy and it was like okay, but we waited like an hour for it. What you're was right, that for? You know what? I just want chicken strips. That's all I want. You think the other place you're going to get sushi has chicken strips? I think so. I think so. It's a bowling alley. You know, that feels like if you're going to serve... Sushi doesn't feel like a bowling alley food. Chicken strips, chicken strips do. So I think probably there. There's also like some other places that we can always go to. But we'll figure that out no, once we get there. I think there. we should do a one-stop shop, you know? No, I'm going to go to Raglan Road. I'm going to get some deep fried scallops, gluten free, of course. And then I'm just going to eat scallops in the theater. That's disgusting. But it's, it's also not. So it's not. Don't judge me. I'm a pescatarian. <laughs> That's rude. I'm sorry, Bestie. <laughs> I mean, you're just, and they're super crunchy, too. Like, think about, like, you ever had, like, the Funyun chips, and you've heard how crunchy those things are? That's how crunchy Raglan Road makes their gluten-free stuff. It's like... I mean, technically, we are just sneaking in, like, food to a theater, which is, like... I don't know. People could say it's disgusting. I don't think it's disgusting. I, I literally it's- wrote a review to AMC recently, and I'm like, for the love of God, please add something else gluten free. <laughs> I beg. I can't just keep doing the pop. I'm. I've lived too much of a luxurious life at Sinopolis to go to AMC and only be subjected to fruit gummies and popcorn. No, I no, need no. more sustenance. Yes, we need entrees. I need options. I mean, dude, they're like serving like duck a l'orange or some shit like that, you know, and I can't even get something gluten free. I'm so sorry, bestie. Oh, you know what I could struggle. do? I can get a kid's chicken tenders. And I can also get mozzarella sticks. Are you looking up a menu? Yes. Oh my God. That's how I get myself excited. I'm like, ah. No, for the movie, for the food. No, I do the same though. I do the same. I do the exact same. I can get chicken tenders, fries, and mozzarella sticks. That's a spread. But wait a minute, didn't you get didn't you get salmonella from the the mozzarella sticks? Okay, no, I got salmonella from the dine-in mac and bacon mac and cheese, and I will never, never have anything. What I will have is the so AMC at the concession stand has like express food. So they have like pizza and mozzarella sticks. The mozzarella sticks have been buenissimo. These twice, this, these twice. What did you I've just had say? It. Buenissimo. 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 Yes. What does that mean? Chef's kiss. Oh, I thought it was bellissimo. Yeah, buenissimo. I mixed the words up. 
<laughs> Wait, what? Is it Buenissimo or no, Bellissimo? No, no, I'm just being stupid. It's Bellissimo, but I said Buenissimo. Because I, I was like, is, is that, are you confusing Bueno? I'm speaking Gucci <laughs> Italian. <laughs> Bro, you're pulling a you're pulling Apollo Gucci right now. Buenissimo mozzarella sticks. So I'm gonna Buenissimo. get that. Buenissimo. I right. can't. I'm gonna get that with my AMC rewards that I've been stacking up. So if you want <laughs> popcorn or something, it's on me. So salmonella for free. No, only the bacon mac and cheese. Okay, the mozzarella okay. sticks I, are good. I got you. I, I shouldn't be talking. I'm the one who's saying threatening to smuggle in sushi. So I should not be talking. <laughs> you know, uh, but. Thank you guys so much for listening to our little, literally us plan what we're going to eat <laughs> at the movie theater because um, we are just foodies like that. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And when you hear next from us, it, we should be talking about House of Gucci um, and maybe a little bit of Oscar talk. We'll see. Um, so without further ado, thank you so much for listening. Bye. Bye. Bye.